So we've talked about comparing two different distributions. And this is the second part of these 1.2 notes. We're going to start talking about stem plots. Some of you may already be familiar with stem plots, or otherwise known as stem and leaf plots. That's our first blank here. So it is actually a, a simple uh, graph to make, as long as we keep it well organized. Um, it says stem plots give us a quick picture of the distribution while including the actual numerical values. So the steps to make a stem plot, again, they're not overly difficult. The first part, separate each observation into a stem, which is all but the final digit, and a leaf, which is actually the final digit. So the stem is everything except the final digit because we don't want to use those for our stems. The final digit, one digit long, represent our leaves, if you will. Step two, write all possible stems from the smallest to largest. We're going to organize those stems in a vertical column and draw a vertical line to the right of the column. Step three, write each leaf in the row to the right of its stem and make sure they're arranged in increasing order out from the stem, which means they get bigger as they go away from the stem. And then step five, an important part of any graphical display you make. Uh, don't forget to provide a key that explains in context what the stems and leaves represent. So below here, it says these data represent the responses of 20 female AP statistics students to the question, how many pairs of shoes do you have? Construct a stem plot. So lots of different responses to this question. How can we organize this data in a way that's graphically appealing? We're going to make a stem and leaf plot like that. So let's start with our stems. And for two-digit numbers, the stems are just going to be the tens place. So for example, the 3 from the 38 or the 5 from the 51. And that leaves us with the ones place for our leaves. So the last digit on each number will be our leaves. So my stems, and I'm going to draw that vertical line. So my stems go on the left-hand side, my leaves will go on the right-hand side. So what kind of stems am I going to have here? Um, well, look at the biggest number and the smallest number here in the data set. Looks like we've got a 13 and a 57 is the biggest. So our stems can just start at the 1 and go all the way up to 5. Because again, we're, we're using that tens place for our stems. So we don't need 6 or 7 because nobody that responded to this survey said they had 60 pairs of shoes or 70 plus pairs of shoes. So we only need for stems a 1 through a 5. So we'll start up top here with the smallest numbers. So we have a 13, a 13, a 19, another 13, and a 15. All of those numbers will be included under this one stem. So let's see. I've got three 13s. One, two, three. Go ahead and cross those off. And then for each one, I'll put a three. So three, three, three. And then I've got a 15 and a 19 as well. So I can add a five and a nine. Notice I put those in order also. So that three goes for a 13. That three goes for a 13. So does that three. And then that five goes for the 15, and then the 9 goes for the 19, and I'm crossing those off as I go to kind of keep track of things. So how about for the 2 stem? Who do we have in the 20s here? So um, looks like we got a 22, a 23, another 23, a 24, and two 26s. So let's go ahead and organize those. We had a 22, a couple 23s, 24 and 226s. Okay, who do we have in the 30s for that stem? Looks like we have still one, two, three, four people in the 30s, which makes 31 will give us a 1, the 34 we take the 4, the 30, we would take the 0. 38, we take the 8. Let's make sure we put those in order. Go ahead and add those. So we had a 30, a 31, a 34, and a 38. 
Hopefully you can start to see the shape that this graph is taking. It's almost like a sideways dot plot, but instead of dots, we have the actual numbers from the observations over here. And then only one person responded in the 40s. We have a 49 right there, so go ahead and we'll go ahead and add a 9 for the 49 part. And then for the 50s, we had a 50 and a 57, two 50s. Two 50s, a 51, and a 57. So that completes our distribution. Every single person in the data set has a leaf corresponding to a stem over here in our graph. One thing we don't have yet, though, and it's critical here, kids oftentimes forget this, we need a key. And all you have to do is use one example. There's a bunch of examples of leaves on here. All you have to do is grab one. So pick your favorite one. My favorite one is the four and the nine here. So let's give that some context. So the four, and then I see that's my stem, and the nine is my leaf. So for my key, I'm just going to use that as an example. For my key, let's say the four, and you call this a slash. It's really just a little vertical line here. Four with a nine. What does that represent? Because if you tell me what that represents, I can kind of pick up and figure out what the rest of them represent as well. So the four with the nine, that represents a female AP stat student owning 49 pairs of shoes. So I know it seems simple, but that's probably the most common mistake is forgetting to put a key on there to give us some reference what the heck these numbers even mean what they correspond to. So you just have to pick one, whichever one you like the most, and give it as an, as an example in your key, and then provide context with what that number is going to represent. In this next part here, it says when data values are blank, notice the quote marks. So in that blank, we actually want the phrase bunched up. When data values are bunched up, we can get a better picture of the distribution by splitting stems. When you think of bunched up, just think, just think if we had to cram uh, a big data set onto this stem and leaf plot. Maybe it will start to go off the page. So when they're too bunched up, what can we do? Well, this one's actually not so bad. Um, why don't we just have the smaller ones be in one stem and the larger ones be in another stem? Or the same thing for the twos. Smaller twos go to one stem, bigger twos go to another stem. So one way to look at that would be like, um, for the ones, you have two stems. For the twos, you have two stems, threes, two, like, so you have double the amount of stems, um, two for each number. And you could do 10 through 14 on this one, and then 15 through 19 on this one. So just as a side example here, we could have maybe one, one, two, three, four, four, those would all be smaller values. And then we could have five, seven, nine, the bigger values would go in the second stem here. So same thing, the twos, any data I get that's four or smaller would be in the first stem, and then the bigger numbers would be in the second stem. So five, six, seven, eight, nine, anything would go to that stem. Same for the threes, smaller numbers, and the bigger numbers. So if you have a bunch of numbers that are bunched up, right? one method you can use is splitting the stems. So that's what you do if you have data that's too bunched up and it's hard to read or make out the shape of the distribution. What do we do if we have two different groups, two different, dis different distributions that we'd like to compare? Well, we can use back-to-back -back stem plots that have common stems. So let's say we're talking about the same exact study. Here's the same data for the females. What if we want to compare it to uh, 20 AP stat students that were males? So here's the group, here's the um, data for how many pairs of shoes each kid owned. So if these are back to back, and you can think about two people standing back to back, we're going to start by putting those stems in the middle. So we've already made the one for females. One, two, three, four, five. There's our stems. Is that going to be all the stems we need? Well, we'll see. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually put the females on the left-hand side. And we've already got this data done. So we've already, for the ones, 
we know we had 3, 3, 3, 5, 9 for the 2s, 3, 3, 4, 6, 6 for the 3, 0, 1, 4, 8. We've already done this one. Now, you might be asking, wait, why are they in a different order now? To which I would say, great question. When we make these stem and leaf plots, we want the smaller numbers close to the stem and they increase as they go away from the stem. So the fact that the female group is on the left-hand side here, they have smaller numbers on the inside, and then as we go further away to the outside, that's where the bigger numbers go. So if you were thinking that, great question. Uh, so I'm leaving off a few people for the females. So I have my 49 still, and then the ones that were in the 50s. There we go. So how about for the males? They're going to be on the other side of this back-to-back -back plot. Oh, you know what? There's a 2 I forgot for the females. There was a 22. I'm missing a 2 in my 20 stem. So we had that earlier. Let me go ahead and add that in. 3, 3, 2. Squeeze that 2 in there. And now I think I'm good with that one. So for the males, where are we going to jump in here? If you'll notice, it wouldn't be quite right to start with the 1 stem. Those people that have 10 or more or in the teens as far as their, their data goes, we have people below 10 pairs of shoes. So to be correct here, we should make a zero stem. So I have to go ahead and make that adjustment. Put a zero here, make a little room, because there's quite a few of the males that would fall in numbers below 10. So you can think of it like 0, 05, 0, 06, 0, 04. So that's fine. We'll just use a zero stem. And then let's go ahead and mark off who we need who's below 10 here. So we got a 4, a 5, 5, another 5, 6, 7, 7, 7, 7, and 8. All underneath the 0 stem. So a 4, 3 fives, a 6, 4 sevens, and an 8. I took care of a lot of the distribution there. And then in the teens, We've got 1, 2, 3, 4 people at 10, an 11, we had a 12, and we had a 14. And for the 20s, we just have one person here at 22 pairs of shoes. And then one more, or two more, we have a 35 and a 38. Beautiful, back-to-back -back stem plot. Now we can compare the male data directly to the female data um, using a, sim a stem plot at the same time. So I don't know who invented this, but wow, what a great invention. Don't forget, if you look at the way the numbers are organized, it starts with the smaller numbers on the inside and bigger numbers go to the outside. So if you're on the left-hand side for the females, it goes out this way for the bigger numbers, and the right-hand side for the males goes out this way for the bigger numbers. The only thing we're missing now is a key. So Pick your favorite observation. Um, on the male side, how about 2-2, two, two, right? And what does that represent? So 2 with a little bar 2. Just give one example. That's my favorite one. That would represent a male AP stat student owning 22 pairs of shoes. So you could have picked, picked any of them. Uh, I just like that one. It kind of jumped off the page at me. So 2 with a little bar and a 2. Oh, so now I know I can sort out what all these numbers mean on the right-hand side. And just to be clear, we could say that same thing for the females. I'm not going to rewrite all that, and I don't think you want to either, but let's use quote marks. So, and 9 bar 4, in this case, right, this would be the female with 49 pairs of shoes. So that's the female with 49 pairs of shoes. We don't have to rewrite all of it. I just use the quote marks to represent the words and the phrases that were said right here, just above. Is it necessary to remark about the females here? Yeah, I think so. Right? Just, just like you might have questions about how this data is organized, somebody else might have questions also. So we need to go ahead and say that the, the way you see this right here, that actually represents a female with 49 pairs of shoes. All right, lastly for these notes, unimodal, bimodal, and uniform. Those are actually words that describe shapes of distributions. Uh, when you think back to your very elementary knowledge or very early knowledge of statistics, you remember the word mode, 
being the number that occurred the most. So if we can think about drawing that smooth curve, this is still kind of the same thing, the number that occurs the most. Unimodal, the, the, um, the prefix uni here implies one, so one mode. Bimodal, two modes. Uniform, well, that means it's the same throughout. So let's take a look at different uh, pictures or visualizations of what these distributions might look like. These describe the shape of a distribution. So you'll get really good at drawing these throughout the semester, but unimodal means it has one peak. So here's my ground and here's my hill. So I could draw that smooth curve over my dot plot. And the highest point here, the peak, that would probably represent the mode, the value that occurred the most. So unimodal is one peak, bimodal is two peaks. Uniform, though, that means uniform means the same throughout. So you can think of it as a flat or a constant distribution. There's no hills or valleys. It just starts here, stays the same height all the way, and then it's done. Kind of boring looking compared to the other two, um, but that's a uniform distribution. Unimodal, bimodal, there is no trimodal, and then there's Uniform, the flat one. So now you've just boosted your vocab for when you have to go describe distributions. Okay, in the last little bit we need to talk about for these notes, Q2 says, what is the most important thing to remember when making a stem plot? So I think stem plots are actually pretty straightforward. I think uh, everybody pretty much does a good job in handling them. What they do forget, most commonly, most, the easiest way to get points off is they don't make a key. So if you can focus on that part, don't forget to provide a key. So grab your favorite little example from the stem plot and say what it means in context. So we've learned about stem plots. You added some new vocab terms for describing the shape of a distribution. And that is actually all for these notes. I'll see you in class.